So I was hoping to be able to just wear this and walk around, but if I put it down like this, no one can hear me. So <laughs> I'm just gonna, gonna do this with the mic, and, uh, and you can all hear me now, yes? Okay, fabulous. Uh, so we're gonna talk about going beyond what we typically think of as defense. I'll walk you through the agenda. Oop. Okay, well, I'll walk you through the agenda. We'll talk a little bit about uh, where we're headed. So I'll give you a little background about me, a little more than what he uh, explained. Then we're gonna talk about the background of where this talk came from. Why does it matter? Why did I feel like this was a, a topic uh, to bring to the masses, so to speak, and, and kind of the history? And by looking at that information, we'll start to see why the way defenders tend to think is problematic and it leads to a bunch of assumptions. And those assumptions can bite us. Um, and then because of that, what I will recommend and what we'll see is an immersion in offensive security. And by that, I do not mean you are suddenly all going to become offensive security professionals. That is not necessary. It's more about spending time around the folks that do that and starting to understand how they think so that you can start to think the way they do when you're looking at your own environments. Um, and then we'll, we'll sum it up. So this is a little more about me. Uh, I always have a slide with a sloth or two um, because I love sloths. This guy here uh, is Flash. He is a, a sloth at the Buffalo Zoo that I adopt. Um, I think sloths are cool, and that's really all there is to say about that. I do a lot of things. Uh, I run besides Rochester, uh, and I volunteer with a lot of conferences. Um, if you, you know, care more about this, find me on the socials, and I'm happy to talk to you. Uh, but I do lots of stuff. All right. So how do we get here? And I don't mean here. And I don't even mean here within the context of the history of security, because lots of people talk about that, and it's cool, uh, but, but that's kind of not the point of this talk. I want to talk about where I got this idea. And so let's, let's go back in my history to the University of Buffalo, where I work, decided that they were going to start helping students learn how to prepare for something called CCDC, which is the collegiate um, cyber defense competition that uh, students can get involved in. How many people have heard of CCDC? Quite a number of people. Awesome. Okay, so when, when we decided to start offering an independent study and sort of teach kids like, you know, here's what you need to do to be good at this competition, a bunch of industry professionals, including myself, got together in a room and we started to just brainstorm. And in that room was somebody that I met who works in the offensive security space. It was something I knew very little about. I'd heard the terms red team, I'd heard the terms pen test, I knew nothing really about what any of that meant. Uh, now let me ask you, how many of you are defenders in here? Most of you. How many of you do offensive security? A few, good, I want you here because I want you to, to attest or not attest to what I'm gonna be talking about. Um, I will be looking to you for head nods uh, and your fellow folks in the room to, to you know, agree or disagree. Um, but what I discovered was a whole other world. And I had said to this uh, friend of mine slash colleague who now works for TrustedSec, I said, so tell me about offensive security. What is it? How can I learn more? How can I learn more about that topic? And he said, go to a B-Sides. I said, what the heck's a B-Sides? I'd never heard of that. Now, how many of you have heard of B-Sides? Good number of you. Awesome. But a lot of people have never heard of B-Sides. And that's unfortunate. So I did my Google Foo, and I looked up, what's a B-Sides? Okay. I mean, he explained it to me, generally speaking. And for those of you who are not familiar, B-Sides is a conference. Um, there are loosely affiliated conferences all over the world um, that are security conferences, and it, it started with a conference in Vegas. Uh, for those of you who remember what a record is, um, it's, the, it's the flip side, right? So it was a bunch of people who didn't get accepted to a major conference in Vegas, but there were so many amazing talks, they were like, let's do this thing called the B-Sides, and it offered an opportunity for these folks to, to still give their talks. 
Um, and so I looked it up, and I found out, hey, there's this B-Sides Rochester thing. And I got myself a ticket, and, and B-Sides is very welcoming and very open and all about education and not very expensive. Um, you know, it was free at one point, but what we found is uh, if you don't charge money for a ticket, people just don't show up. And then you're like, crap, I don't know how many to plan for. Um, so, you know, but, but we're talking like 20 bucks, right? We're not talking like even the price to come here. It's very, very reasonable. So I got myself a ticket and I went to my first B-Sides. And I walked in the door and now first of all, my first B-Sides was at the German house, which is a very unique space. And that was kind of cool, right? And I just started interacting with people, asking them about like what they were doing. Some people were playing a CTF, some people were playing with stuff on the tables, some people were getting ready to go to talks. And I just started asking questions. Uh, and I started to learn more about these folks. And what I discovered was just how eager everybody was to teach me about what they knew and what they did. And compared to many of the traditional InfoSec conferences that I've attended, this literally was a whole other world. Folks are, are, are certainly willing to, to talk in, in InfoSec conferences, but by and large what I found is they're very busy, they're feeling overwhelmed, they, they're so busy trying to figure out how to fend that they're not excited anymore. And what I found at B-Sides was that awesome excitement. And there were certain people at that conference who were so nice to me, <laughs> including Jason, um, that I came back the following year as a volunteer. And fast forward, I now run B-Sides Rochester because it was a world-changing experience for me and I love being a part of it. But it really was different. It was like falling into another world. Now, I have to ask this because I'm getting old and I mention these movies and people are like, I don't know what you're talking about. Who's seen The Matrix? Okay, good. So many people these days like have never seen it. Uh, you know, I work in a university and the kids get younger and I get older and <laughs> you mention things like The Matrix or even some of the older hacker movies like, you know, you say, have you seen hackers? And they're like, what? Have you seen sneakers? How about war games? And I get blank stares. Um, and that just says I'm getting old. Uh, but these are all classics, right? So, so it was a matrix moment where I had always been taking the blue pill and suddenly I took the red pill and realized, hey, there's this whole other world. And that whole other world started to give me a very, very different impression of security than I'd had before. So when I talk about defense and offense, just to make sure we're on the same page, I'm going to talk about what I mean by those terms. So this is what I have in mind for defense. And I'm not going to read it to you. You're quite capable. But it's, you know, the folks who are defending the things. And that's literally anybody who's responsible for some portion of defense. Does not matter whether it's somebody who is a network admin or someone, you know, formally in the security group. And I would argue, to a certain degree, offensive could fall into that too, right? But that's not really their primary day-to-day -day directive. And that's why I separate this. And you will see when I get here, I'm not using terms like red, blue. I'm not talking about specifically pen test or red teaming because everybody has different in, you know, definitions of what all those things are and how they work. And I don't want to get hung up in those definitions because it doesn't matter. The point is the offensive folks are testing the defenses the defenders put in place, whatever they are, which is why I have such a broad view of defense. Okay, so, so this is what I want to make sure everybody understands, and that's why I'm not using that specific language. I do mention the sort of red-blue at the outset because I do think people understand it in connection with the matrix. I think it kind of makes sense. So here is an example of how a typical defender sees a system. You go to put up a web server doesn't matter what kind of web server. And the goal in this slide is to try to capture some best practices. And, and I mean like all the best practices, right? So if there's something missing up here and you're like, oh, she didn't put that, it doesn't matter. The point is let's assume you go through and you do all the things you're supposed to do as a defender, all the best practices. So 
you're going to install it, you're going to patch it, you're going to scan it for vulnerabilities, you're going to harden all of the things you can harden. It, it doesn't matter. The point is, these are the kinds of things we do, right? As defenders, you agree? And then when we're done, until we know that, say, there's a patch needed or there's some sort of weird vulnerability, um, we may monitor the logs, but we're kind of done with that machine, right? Okay. Here's how an offensive security professional views that same machine. They're like, huh, port 80 or 443 and or they're open. Cool, what can I do with that, right? They're gonna look to see what fields are available for input. What can they do with those fields? Are they interesting? How about how the site interacts with the server? Can they learn anything about that? Can you, they do directory traversal? And the most important thing that they're looking at is its relationship to any other system in your environment or other systems in general. Am I right, OFSEC folks? Yeah, so they're, they're nodding. Now, you defenders, when you look at a system, does any of this ever really occur to you? For some of you, yes. For many of you, it probably is never even like, you, it's not something you think about. And it's certainly not something I'd ever thought about until I started spending time in this space. So the problem is, and I, I love this quote from John Lambert, who's, who gave me permission to use it specifically. So defenders think in lists, right? And attackers think in graphs. And as long as this is true, the attacker wins. But what I will say is, I get people who give me pushback about the graph part. And what I will tell you is, it doesn't matter whether it's specifically graphs. The point with the graphs is the relationships. If you're not thinking about your systems in terms of the relationship to other systems, this is where attackers will get you. Because you can do all the hardening you want on a box, and unless you think ahead about how could that box be leveraged for something else, which is what your offset counterparts are doing, you're out of luck. So relationships are key. How many people have ever seen Bloodhound? A few of you. If you've never seen Bloodhound, this is an amazing tool that OFSEC folks use all the time. It is, it is free and it is something that defenders can use as well, but as with every tool I mention in this talk, it is not a tool you wanna just go randomly installing in your environment because if your environment is set up correctly, lots of bells and whistles will fire and it will be cranky, okay? Now, what this tool does is it shows you the relationships between uh, uh, accounts, the groups they're in, and ultimately it can show you things like how, what is the shortest path to domain admin or global admin. These are tools that help OFSEC folks do their jobs that much faster. Because if they can find that path quickly and their goal happens to be DA, which it isn't always, slam dunk. So if you don't know what that path is and you haven't thought ahead about how to prevent that, you're missing a lot of information. Um, but Andy Robbins, uh, this is a slide from, from something he did. He is amazing. If you're not familiar with Specter Ops, they do some, some absolutely fabulous stuff. So the point of all of this is that because of the way defenders tend to think and not thinking ahead about these relationships, we make assumptions. Now some of these assumptions, you're gonna chuckle and say, oh my God, I can't believe anybody makes those assumptions, but I'm here to tell you, every one of the ones I tell you about, somebody's making an assumption about. Somebody in defense out there, okay? So just break the chain. Who's heard of the cyber kill chain? A number of you, okay? And what you've heard probably about the kill chain is there are all these steps and all we have to do is break the chain and we're good, right? Okay, here's the, here's the cool part. If I'm an offsec and you break the chain and they break the chain in one spot and you think, hey, we're done, cool, I've stopped the, the, the attacker, yeah, no, a good offsec person and an attacker will be like, eh, I couldn't get in this way, I'm gonna try to go in this way. And that's why those relationships are so important. Because if you see an attempt coming in a certain way, and you're not then looking for other attempts from the same threat actor, you're missing a huge part of that story. And I find this all the time. Oh, we stopped the thing. 
The tool we have in place stopped the thing. Great, did you look to see what else could be happening? Uh, and that's a problem. So this is one I usually get a lot of chuckles on. We have AV or EDR, we're good to go, right? Does anybody in here actually believe that entirely? Yeah, lots of no's. If you do believe it, that's okay. We're here to learn. That's kind of the point, right? Um, for those of you not familiar, it's not just about what this stuff can detect. It's about the fact that a really good offsec professional will just simply disable it. And I've seen this in multiple environments where, um, I mean, those of you in offsec, right? If, 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 you, if you don't want to go around it, do you just turn it off? Yeah, you just turn it off. How many of you have something that can detect if these tools are turned off? A couple. Be aware, if you don't, you should, because that is going to be a thing. And I have seen that in, in our own environment where an attacker turned off AV and, you know, or turned off the EDR, and it's right in the logs, and, and people were like, oh, I didn't see that. Hmm, that's a problem. Um, there's also folks that do research, like there are groups that literally research how to get around these things, both legally and not legally, right? So you have, you have some legitimate offsec researchers that will look for this, that actually are looking to find out, you know, how do I get around XYZ product? And then there are people who are not necessarily legitimate and they're looking for the same information. And sometimes the researchers find what the attackers are doing and they learn from each other, which is kind of interesting. Um, but the point is, you know, there is active research going on. So don't think for a minute that the research only goes one way. Um, and then there's ways to completely escape AV and EDR entirely. Who's heard of lull bins? Very few of you. All right. So here's a big thing, and we can talk about this more later if you'd like. Lull bins are living off the land binaries. They are built in to the operating system. They are files the OS uses legitimately, but have other uses and other features that can be used for badness, okay? So here's the problem with old bins. Is your AV or EDR gonna fire on a file that is being used by the operating system that's part of the operating system? Uh, not unless you configure it to fire on something in particular, right? And the reality is most these, of these things you're not going to find just straight up from your you know, various services. You need something custom to be looking for these. And there are lull bins that are very seldomly used in regular day-to-day -day use. So you should be looking for those because they can do all kinds of interesting things. So if you're not familiar with lull bins, spend some time, do some research. Um, there's a huge list of them. Anything, essentially, that, can, that is on a system by design. So it, it, it can be the operating system. It can be a third-party tool that you have on a system. Anything that can be used against you is really a lull bin like that, right? It's, it's living off the land. I don't, as an attacker, an offsec professional, I do not have to install anything. I don't have to do any file placement on your system because check it out. It's already there. I just have to get there and then I can use these things against you. There's also, you know, some other stuff. There, you can do um, C2 callbacks and code execution, and Lord knows there's lots of AD abuse that you will never see in your AV or your EDR. Okay, so this is another topic that I find a lot of folks don't entirely understand and I think is critical. Um, so who here is familiar with the Pyramid of Pain? Anybody familiar with the Pyramid of Pain? A couple. All right, so the pyramid of pain basically shows you how easy it is for an attacker to change what they're doing. So the bottom of the pyramid of pain are things like IP address, domain name, right? And those things, if an attacker comes after you from a particular IP and you recognize that IP is bad, you block it. And so they go, oh, I'll just switch IPs. Makes it very simple. The higher you go in the pyramid, the harder it is for them to continue without being detected. The very top of that pyramid is the TTP pyramid, which is something that uh, Chris Peacock, who works for Scythe, really flushed out a little bit more because the top was really just TTPs. 
TTPs, so this idea of tactics, techniques, and procedures. What is important about the TTP pyramid is that almost all of your tools function at the technique level. So all your EDRs, all the things that you have in place, they're looking for techniques. So let me briefly just do a little rundown here. Um, so a tactic is the goal. So for example, stealing credentials, pretty straightforward. A technique is going to be a way you're going to achieve that goal. So for example, dump LSAS memory. That is a technique that attackers can use. The problem is, how many different ways are there to dump LSAS memory? A bazillion, okay? The procedure is the specific. How that technique is actually carried out. So to do that, are they using proc dump, task manager, there are DLLs you can use. So who's familiar with the MITRE attack matrix? Good, lots of people, right? So MITRE attack's great, but here's the problem with MITRE attack. The, this is a heat map, and the point of the heat map is to say, we have a detection in place for this technique. Okay, that's great. You have a detection for the technique, and so most people create these things and the green is supposed to indicate that they have a technique detection in place. If you have a detection for a technique in place, have you accounted for all the procedures? No. So what does this heat map even tell you? Well, it tells you you have probably a particular procedure that you have some kind of detection for, or you have something so generic it may not detect anything. So it's not that, it's that the that attack is bad, and it's not that having detections isn't good, it's be aware of the limitations of these things. And because as defenders, we're normally thinking about this in a particular way, it doesn't occur to us that there's this other step that's missing. I love this one. We have tools, tools do the thing. Right? And they always do the thing right, assuming they're on. All right. So there are a couple of phenomenal researchers. Will Dorman is one of them. He did some research and is continuing to follow this, having to do with the feature set that Microsoft put into their ecosystem to detect dangerous drivers. His initial research ultimately determined that Microsoft claimed it can do X, Y, and Z that actually it, it didn't do any of that. It was supposed to have a list of vulnerable drivers to block them in the list initially, empty, completely empty. Eventually, Microsoft owned up to this and they have added some things, but as far as I know, they still have no plan for how to regularly update this, how to make changes to it, how to account for new ones that are coming in and so that's a problem. If you think your tools are going to detect the things that the you know, vendor claims they're going to detect and you haven't actually tested that, I wouldn't assume. Assumptions are dangerous, right? Um, so you know, this is just one example. A second one, uh, and uh, Olaf Hartung, who's amazing, um, I had the pleasure of meeting him this past summer in Vegas, and uh, he, so he did this talk uh, at Wild West Hack and Fest last year. And what's cool about this talk is what he determined. So Microsoft Defender looks for things that, you know, are anomalies. And the way they find this stuff is telemetry, right? It's, it's the various hits and the things that it's supposed to detect. So if it's looking for a particular type of badness, it needs certain telemetry to be on. And what he discovered was not everything was on to do it correctly. And of course, none of this is documented. And he did a follow-up to this, as a matter of fact, this past year, and he's done some amazing research um, since then showing uh, essentially how you can learn more about this. So he, he literally just uh, released a new tool that can help with some of this stuff. But, you know, 
these folks are offsec professionals and they're finding the flaws and it's really cool because as an offsec professional, you can use these flaws to your advantage, but so can attackers. So us as defenders, if we're not aware of them, problem. All right, who actually believes if you have MFA, you're not fishable? Okay, cool, no hands. Well, <laughs> do you really believe that? Do you really believe that? That MFA, if you have MFA, you're not fishable? Oh, no. Yeah, so, so um, you know, if you, if you have MFA, obviously there are ways around MFA. And there are organizations that actually believe if you have it in place, you can't be fished. And I would hope most people in the room here know there's lots of ways around that. And probably the most popular right now is the attacker in the middle, the AITM. Um, you know, we, we see instances of that all the time. And because the website that gets returned, it's all done through a proxy, and because the website that gets returned looks exactly like the legitimate thing, people fall for this all the time. So attackers have found very interesting ways to do this. Offsec professionals use the same tools. Um, you know, there's some other stuff. Push, 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 push. Oh, stop, right? And they let them in. Or if you have legacy protocols enabled, there's lots of ways to get around this. So it, it's, MFA is awesome. We need to be careful about how we're using MFA and the configurations we're using. The other thing about MFA is that um, passcodes. So a lot of us print out passcodes for emergency purposes, right? P or people will save the file somewhere. If an attacker gets their hands on that file, you're out of luck, because guess what? Those passcodes are good forever, unless you actively change that. So I would argue a new perspective is needed, and not necessarily one of being upside down, but you get the idea. So that's why I think what we need to do as defenders is we need to immerse ourselves more in offensive security. So how to do that? Well, let's first talk a little bit if you're not familiar with what an offensive security engagement looks like, this is more or less how they work, okay? First, they have to figure out what they're attacking, then find their way in, then figure out how to stay in, and then from there, how do they get to other stuff? Because again, those relationships are key. And then, of course, exfil, right? We got to figure out how to get data out. Um, if you're an offsec professional, in many cases, the point is to prove you could do it, and that's how you prove it. And then, you know, the whole business of getting caught. Offsec folks, do you agree this is more or less what you do? Yeah. So this is what, if you're just not familiar with it, and I know a lot of defenders haven't ever looked at this, that's what it looks like. So first, you have to find those offsec folks. Well, congratulations, you're in a room where there's at least half a dozen of them. So awesome, you're here, okay? Conferences are a great place to find folks. Um, security B-sides, I can't recommend highly enough, not just because I run one, but, you know, there, there are a bunch all over the place. Buffalo, uh, I, I actually live in Buffalo, uh, but we've only had B-sides Buffalo for, uh, this will coming up will be its third year, so it's fairly new, but, but literally you can go to just about anywhere in the world and attend a B-sides. There's even B-sides in, like, Hawaii. So you want to, like, tell your boss, I want to go somewhere awesome and go to a B-sides? Yeah, there you go. Um, there's other, there's local security meetups, so like Rochester has 2,600, there are a bunch of folks who, who are there. Um, anytime, you know, there are maker spaces, there's something called DEF CON groups, which are uh, groups affiliated with the conference. Um, online security communities, if you're not somebody who can afford the time or the money to, to travel for a lot of things, there are amazing online security communities, uh, including Anti-Siphon, Black Hills, Trusted Sec, just to name a few, and they are, usually there's a nice mixture of all the different folks in there. Um, and traditional security communities. I mean, you know, I am a member of the ISSA and that's a more traditional security community. And although I don't do OFSEC, I certainly have met folks uh, in both places. So trainings. It's always a good idea to just kind of get a feel. Uh, again, you, you, it's not about changing jobs. It's not about getting so proficient that you could necessarily do this yourself. But if you can go to trainings that do both offense and defense, or even just offense, to get a feel for what your counterparts in OFSEC are doing, 
it's never a bad idea. As defenders, I find that a lot of people, they go to talks about defense, they go to trainings about defense, and they never go to trainings or talks about offense. Start going to those things. Your eyes will go when you realize what's possible. And you may not understand everything when you sit in one of them, and that's okay. You'll get something, and the next time you'll get something more. The first talks I sat in at B-Size Rochester were way over my head. But I picked up little pieces and I started learning, and it's much like everything in IT or security. There's really no, you know, people ask me all the time, well, how do, where do you get started? And I'm like, I don't know. Well, can I follow in your footsteps? No. <laughs> so, you know, I started at a time when you couldn't go to school for this. It wasn't really a job. It was, you know, it was more like IT stuff. And my role, my, my transition was working in, you know, the IT space. I did uh, phone support, then I did hands-on support, then I did, uh, you know, server administration. And as a result, I wound up getting involved in IR with uh, a colleague, and he started teaching me incident response stuff. That got me interested in forensics, and fast forward, here we are. But, you know, that route, a lot of us go through in some capacity if we've been in this for a while, but new folks may or may not go through that route. So the point is, go to trainings on stuff that is a little out of your wheelhouse and start to learn what's possible. Because if you understand what's possible, the question I get regularly from my boss is, how does this affect us? If you can only answer from sort of this limited, well, we've blocked X and we've, we've locked down Y, and you're not thinking about, well, let's see, if I was an attacker, I might go this way or I might go that way. It's very, very hard to answer that question fully. Um, there's online options. If, again, if, if going places is, is tough or, or financially difficult, some of these online options have free tiers, so you can uh, just you know, work through stuff at home. And higher ed does have some stuff. Uh, RIT has things, we've got, uh, University of Buffalo has some things, there, there are some higher ed options. The one thing I will tell you to be aware of are some of the boot camps. Um, boot camps will teach you stuff, but at a very high level typically, because there's just not enough time to get into it. So you're better off doing s something that's free and being able to dig a little deeper, um, you know, s to get your feet wet. All right, so let's talk about Tradecraft Intel in particular. So the idea of Tradecraft Intel is different from um, organizational Intel. So if there's skills acquired with experience in a particular trade and methodologies that they use. So there's great places to find some of this Tradecraft Intel from your offset counterparts. There are phenomenal reports these are just a couple of places you can find them. Um, Project Zero is Google's researchers, and Attacker KB is Rapid7 researchers. They walk you through, here's how an attack happened, or here's how it worked, and they, and they literally, like, step by step, the attacker did this, and then they did this, and then he did this. Well, that's a great place to learn how these folks are thinking about this, because this is what they actually did, right? And there's lots of other places that have this. But that's one, these are a couple. If you get into these online communities like Discord and Slack, that's another place where people talk about their tradecraft all the time. Ah, I did this cool thing. Like I said, when I went to B-Sides, I was blown away at how much people wanted to just teach me because they're excited about what they do. They love it. I mean, even if they don't necessarily love their day job, like every time they find like a new thing, they're like, ah, I learned this new thing. It's so cool, right? And being around that, I think, is encouraging for all of us. There's, of course, Twitter, X, or whatever they're going to call it next, Mastodon, you know, the other social media spaces there you can find those folks. Organizational intel, on the other hand, uh, can be very interesting from a defender's perspective because if you are not aware of what's out there about your own organization, and how an offensive security person can use that against you, you probably should spend a little time looking. So if I put up something in LinkedIn that says, I have lots of experience in fill in the blank product, guess what you need to start researching if you're offsec? That product, right? Because now you know, I'm, a, I'm going after this organization, they use this particular product, here's how I can get around it, 
boom. Things that are really, really useful for that, job postings. So be aware, you may not be able to change, like you're not gonna get companies that are just not gonna put up job postings looking for what they need, but be aware that your offset counterpoints, counterparts are looking at this information. This is where they're getting their intel about you and therefore so are attackers. Um, lots of stuff on Pastebin and GitHub. We have coding folks who love to share information and it's very common that the orgs they work in have restrictions so that they're not allowed to share directly. So what do they do? They throw it up in Pastebin. You'll never find passwords on Pastebin, that never happens. Uh, or code, right, active code on a project. Um, you know, message boards, so somebody posts, we're having a problem with this particular product. Guess what, now you know, if you didn't already, they have that particular product. Um, I have been pwned is a great place to look because you now know what email addresses potentially there are mm, lists of passwords for, right? And we've seen that too. So this is a list of tools. I promise you we're not gonna go one by one. That would drive me crazy too. But I encourage you, if there is any tool list on this list that you've never ever heard of, take a picture, go home and research it. These are probably the most common tools that OFSEC is using today. Am I right, OFSEC folks? It's some combination of these? Yeah. So you need to understand how these tools work, what they do, again, what they're capable of, which is perhaps, you know, the key to all of this, right? And what you can do to prevent having a problem with one of these tools. Who here has heard of Mimi Cats? Good, most of you. I have had conversations with people who've never heard of Mimi Cats. And for anybody who didn't raise their hand and isn't sure, Mimi Cats is a password stealing tool. And there's lots of different ways you can deploy it. It's very effective. There are ways to deploy Mimi Cats where it doesn't look like Mimi Cats. And your, you know, EDRs and whatever may detect the traditional way, but not the non-traditional ways. I know of an actual situation in which an organization saw Mimi Cats in the logs. Some attacker was trying to use Mimi Cats. And they said, oh look, there it is in the logs. EDR found it and blocked it. We're good. What did I tell you about that kill chain? Oh, yeah, hmm. If you see something like that in the logs, it's awesome that your tool blocked the initial attempt. But you should be looking for other attempts of perhaps other tools, perhaps still Mimi Cats, perhaps something else. But at the end of the day, they're not, you know, if, if they really want into your network, they're not going to just stop. They're going to keep going. So again, I, you know, I encourage you, be familiar with these, these tools and, and what they're capable of. So to kind of sum up, um, understand that, that defense, as we traditionally think of it, is really only half the story. Offense security is the other half. And again, it's not that we need to suddenly become offsec pros. It's that we need to understand what these folks do because what they do is what attackers do. And the way they think is very similar to how attackers think, if not in some cases exactly the same. How do I get around this? How do I get from here to there? How do I pull data out? What is, you know, and honestly, most of the time, and, and I'll ask this of my offsec folks out here, do you use zero days most of the time? Nah, they're gonna use what's there. They're gonna use living off the land binaries. They're gonna use stuff that's easy, easy to use because you know, why work any harder than you have to? Pretty sure everybody would agree with that, right? Nobody wants to work harder than they have to. And that includes OFSEC. So understanding what they do and how they think makes us ultimately better defenders. So beware of assumptions, especially about the controls you have in place. The controls we have in place are great. Do not misunderstand me. It's not that you shouldn't use those controls. It's that you need to be painfully aware of the limitations of the controls we do have. So, you know, if you have something in place, you need to be thinking about how, if, if I'm an attacker or if I'm an offsec pro, how am I gonna get around that? 
what is going to be a, a, you know, a next step. Get to know some OFSEC folks. They're awesome. And learn what they know. And ultimately become a better defender for it. So I have to throw this out here. Shame is self-promotion. I wrote a book. It came out in July. Um, it is called The Active Defender. And if you like what you heard today and you want a little more in depth, how do I become an active defender and, and what do I mean by all of that? It is a Wiley publication. You can literally get it anywhere from Amazon to local bookshops. I've had friends pick it up um, you know, at Barnes & Noble in some cases directly. Uh, there is an e-book available too. And I like to end with this slide because as I mentioned, I didn't wind up in security because I started out to be in security. I may not have you know, intended to wind up in security, but I think ultimately this is exactly where I needed to be. And with that, any questions? Yes. Has the Rochester B-Sides taken place this year? It has taken place for 2023. 2024, we'll, we have a training date on March 22nd, and the 23rd will be the conference. The conference is held at the Rochester, um, at the RIT Inn and Conference Center, and the trainings will be at RIT proper. Um, the basic info is on our website. The CFP, CFT will open probably mid-November. And we already have a keynote, so that, all that stuff's out there. Any other questions? All right. Well, I will be up here for a few minutes afterwards. Thank you so very much for coming and hearing what I have to say.